Come all you moonshiners if you want to hear About the kind of bull that they serve around here Made way back in top of them hills where Welcome back to Barley and Hops. I'm George. Yep, the channel that dares to unlock the mystery of home distilling. <laughs> We're so glad you're back with us today. This is our next installment in uh, making a corn liquor. Uh, we are just one step away from going to the still. Uh, this is a very, very important step in that process. Uh, remember, we've talked about this before. There are many, many, many methods, but the process is the important key notes along that path. Yeah. Um, and I'm cleaning this out because what I want to do is I want to be able to transfer uh, my mash into another container um, and clarify it. Uh, it. You can see this is, you can see why I've kind of transitioned to the wide mouth. They're a whole lot easier to clean. Uh, this is not a daunting task or impossible, but it's just, if you have the option, I mean, uh, why not? Uh, let me set this aside. Uh, I've still got some cleaning and rinsing to do on that and then spray it with star sand, of course, in order to make sure I have a good clean environment. Um, but, but two mashes, uh, 12 days. 12 days were at one point, just right below 1.000, uh, which is the measurement for water. Uh, remember when we started, where were we at? Uh, was, I, if I remember, I, and I forgot to, I usually write it on the side of the fermenter, 1.084, 82, so in that neighborhood. Uh, so that tells me my fermentation is complete. Uh, so for any of you out there who are, who are working, how do I know when my fermentation is complete? Well, when it stops. Uh, when it stops is one point. Um, but the only way to really know for sure is to drop a hydrometer and measure it. You know, and if you measure it and it's all the way down to 1.000 or lower, uh, it's not going to go any lower. It, it's done. Um, and we talked, I believe, before about how in some cases it'll stop at 1.0. 05, 1.010, uh, that has a lot to do with potentially um, solid particulates that you have floating in there. And if it doesn't go any lower, it's just not going to go any lower. You just have more solid particulates than uh, normal, and it's causing your hydrometer to float a little bit higher. Uh, that, that's all that means. So don't get wrapped around the axle. Um, give it, like I said, seven to ten days is plenty of time for it to finish out. Now what it hasn't done yet is it hasn't clarified, it hasn't settled. And that's our next step. We've got many options available to us. Okay, just one way to do this. Remember we have method, I've talked about that many many times, and we have process. Uh, the, you know, it's like the do's and the don'ts and the maybes. You know? And we always like to do this with answering why. Is it like that? Why do we do that? You know, why, is, why do I uh, allow it to settle? You know, why do I clarify? You know, uh, why do yeast work? It, it, when we can answer those, we can understand the full process. Because remember, this is a science, a skill, and an art. And it's a beautiful marriage of all of those things. Um, and when you fully understand that, and it's not that difficult but when you fully understand that, should something go awry in the midst of it, you'll be able to point to it directly and fix it. You see, that's why mechanics are so critical and why they're so good at what they do. They understand the second, third order effects of incidents, things. It, they can go to a specific area when they do their fault symptom index. It, there, there's a lot going on, and you can do the same thing. Uh, if you, you, you do that already, trust me. You do this already. It's intuitive. It's inherent. It, it just happens. Okay, uh, I want to clarify this, um, but the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure I've got another vessel available, and so we can do a couple of different things. Uh, you, you may not have this available. Um, we're going to use a good backyard method to, to clarify this, that anybody can use, okay? Aside from isinglass, which is a chemical, it's an extract from dried fish bladder. Um, you've got quesasol and cheetah sand, which are two chemicals that are put in at two different times, uh, and they call it, they're flocculants, and they cause any and all solid particulates to kind of coagulate together, combine, and drop to the bottom, so it clarifies. 
Um, the bentonite. Bentonite is really widely used in the wine community. Uh, that would work as well. Uh, believe it or not, gelatin. Uh, and I'm not talking like jello, you know, the flavor. You don't want to introduce anything else into this. But you can, you can just get some unflavored gelatin uh, and you could use that. Uh, let me say, gosh, there, there's a bunch of Warflock tablets. Uh, oh my goodness. But you can cold crash it. Uh, if you've got a freezer to put it in or, or a, a, a refrigerator where you can get it down to about 34, 35, maybe 36 degrees Fahrenheit or so, not freezing, uh, you can use uh, temperature in order to aid in clarification. Uh, so there's a, and if you were ingenious enough to build a centrifuge, you could spin it and cause it to do the same thing. But we don't want to go way down that rabbit hole. Um, so we're going to use a simple method, which would be to just transfer it from one location to another. But in doing so, there's one aspect that is universal to a fermentation, whether that be beer, whiskey, or wine. And that in every case, your yeast produced CO2. Right. And of course, ethyl alcohol. But in doing so, what happens is, is that once fermentation is complete, you have a lot, you have a bunch of CO2 that is captured, that is stagnant, that is just sitting there, and it's inside that liquid. So in the wine community, we call this degassing. And we degas in order to aid in clarification, and also so that we, we don't have a sparkly wine. No, good. In beer. Um, we actually add a little bit of sugar at the very end, which is one method, uh, to produce that sparkly, fizzy, bubbly uh, texture and when we drink beer. Uh, it, th there's a bunch of different ways of going about that, but that's it uh, in a nutshell. So, we're going to degas it, and you can degas it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, not a bunch, but quite a few different ways. One is to just stir it and beat it with a paddle. Uh, you can put a whip on the end of a drill, you can do that. Uh, one other method would be to pour it back and forth to degas it, but what's the challenge in that? The challenge in that is, is that we have a large sediment base on the bottom and all we would be doing is mixing that back up and we don't want to do that. Uh, to include, a lot of times twirling it and beating it and spinning it uh, could potentially do the same thing. So what will, people will do normally is they'll transfer it first off of the sediment and then they'll attempt to degas it. We got a method, believe it or not, that'll do both at the same time. Let me get set up and I'll show it to you. Well, here we are from a little bit of a different angle. Yep, I got my mug with me. No, never take a sleeping pill and a laxative at the same time. That's some good advice right there. Now, I've got my fermenter, yeah, the results are very, very predictable, but impossible to control. I've got my fermenter here. Now, here's one option I have. Uh, it, this is perfectly okay. Um, one method would be to siphon, and that is, you know, drop a line in here, a hose, put my other container, put a vacuum on it, like, and then siphon. We all understand the siphoning process and siphon all of that out, leaving the sediment behind, yes, and then degas that. Uh, I have a proposal, uh, and this work, I, I do this a lot, <laughs> because I find it a whole lot easier. Um, this, what this will do, this process, or method uh, in this process, will uh, eliminate you know, moving and carrying a bunch of heavy stuff if you can find a permanent place to put your fermenters. Um, I've taken, we're going to use a vacuum cleaner. Uh, I've taken a cap, and what I've done is I've popped two holes in the top of that, and that's a, a cap for a carboy. Now, there's many different methods for, for designing this on your own because they're real simple to put together. Uh, I put one is a, a vacuum line, and one is a feed line. And I left the center hole open for my finger. I can use that as a vent to turn it on, turn it off. Uh, you can get away with not even having that. You, you can just 
Turn your vacuum on and turn it off. It, it, it's totally up to you, but I use that as a, a, a method for operating, okay? Uh, if I place this, oh, this is crazy, it's so easy. If I place this in the top, now let me ask a question while I'm getting set up. How long will a mash last? Oh my goodness. Well, it's almost indefinite. Uh, because remember, ethyl alcohol is a natural preservative, and as long as you leave it closed off to the atmosphere, it will last almost indefinite. I have had, I can tell you this from personal experience, I've had a mash that I found up in the attic that had been sitting there for two years, and I ran that and made some excellent moonshine. It, I just had it closed off to the atmosphere. Now, it, that kind of begs the question, why? Why do we close it off of the atmosphere? I've heard of open vat distillation or open vat fermentation. Yeah, that's a thing. Yeah. And these huge, large open vats uh, where they've got, you, you look in, you can see the bubbles popping, you can see the crust forming. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, remember, CO2 is heavier than air. And as long as you can avoid any drafts, from blowing that CO2 away, that CO2 will form a cushion that will protect it from the air, from the oxygen, and from anything else getting into that. But at some point in time, that fermentation is going to slow down, that CO2 is going to start to dissipate, and you're going to need to cover it. Why do we cover it? Oh, see, there's another. Answer the question why. You, you cover it because You've all heard about it turning to vinegar. Oh, I got to get it done in three days or it turns to vinegar. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a reason why that myth started or that inconsistent theory. Um, is it possible to turn alcohol into vinegar? Acetic acid? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely you can do that. But you're going to need two things. Uh, you're going to need the acetobacter bacteria, which is everywhere just like yeast it's in the air it's on flowers it's on plants it's in the dirt it's it's kind of everywhere uh, you're going to need that or you need to put it in yourself uh, and you're going to need oxygen uh, air oxygen uh, so you're going to need those two things in order to make that happen so how do we avoid a mash turning into vinegar which takes about two to three months um, we do that by cutting off the one thing we know we can control, which is the atmosphere. We just cover it, seal it, uh, and that prevents the acetobacter bacteria from getting in, and it also, any that's in there, it prevents oxygen from getting in there, which gives the acetobacter bacteria an opportunity to convert ethanol to acetic acid. Huh, who'd have thunk it? Watch this, this works so well I'll uncover this, and this has such a wonderful aroma. I'm going to slowly and carefully insert. Now you'll notice on this, I cut a small, I cut a slant on here so that I can work it all the way down. I want to try to remove this liquid from the top down and put it inside this container while they're side by side without having to move anything heavy. So, whoops, what I need to do is attach, I got a small adapter for the end of my vacuum. You can do this in many, many different ways as well. And if I just insert that into that small vacuum hole and get this to set just right, now it's going to be a little noisy as it gets started and then we'll cut it off and I'll show you what happens. I turn on the vacuum my vent. What's happening? I'll leave that sit there so it doesn't, oh, yep, it dropped out. All right. Evidently, I've got to find a way to keep this line from falling out of here. There we go. What was happening? We were transferring from this vessel into this vessel, and you've seen it shooting down in here, and you saw it start to bubble up. 
What's taking place? It's transferring it at the same time as degassing. Yes, that vacuum, which is strong enough, and this is only a small one and a half horsepower, uh, no, one and a half gallon, two peak horsepower. It, not a lot. It's one of those $19 jobs you can buy at Walmart. <laughs> While it's doing that, it's removing that gas that's produced as it starts to bubble. It's removing that gas at the same time. So what we're doing is we're actually transferring and degassing at the same time. It just simplifies the process. It's a method to simplify the process. Is it necessary? To me it is, uh, because it simplifies my process. Uh, I don't have to move these jugs. Um, I can leave them sitting right here. I don't have to have one higher than the other, which you know you need for a siphon. Uh, this is sort of like a side-by-side -side siphon all at one time. And, oh, by the way, I'm degassing. So I can do this, and then, oh, once I get this cleaned out, I can do the same thing and send it back. Yes. Uh, it's totally up to you. Now, I thought about something else, and I actually tried it. It works extremely well. <laughs> uh, if we can do this, uh, we could actually... How many of us have had that challenge of trying to add our mash into the still? How, well, how do you do, you could, again, you could siphon, you could take buckets and pour, or why not put a vacuum on the still and suck all of your mash into the still through the column, uh, and at the same time you're checking for leaks. Kind of makes sense to me. I did that. I'll show you that. This is the eight gallon dual purpose pot reflux still from Mile High. And remember I showed you the, we had that small vent or valve on the outside that you can attach a um, relief valve to. And it comes plugged. So all you have to do is remove that plug. And I've fashioned, I just, get, look, and there's, a, again, a bunch of different ways to do this. I've just got a small valve that I insert into that. And just get it snug. And this one, I can do this one just finger tight, yeah. Now I've got a tube. And I put a cap on the area where the heating element goes in. And I've also capped off the top. So now I have what would be considered once this is hooked up, a closed system. So this is the exit port of the still. And what I've done was I've just loosened the arm and I've rotated it down so it's a little bit, so it's beside the still. It, it, you, can, you can do that. Or you can leave it stuck out of a 45 degree angle. That's totally up to you. But if I place this tube on here and I insert the other one inside and I'm going to use this carboy that's full of water just as an example to show you how this works and then if I attach my vacuum to the end of this small hose when I turn this on I will be emptying this carboy of what could potentially be mash from this container into this container in the same method that we just transferred from one fermenter to another let me show you. And it's really neat because you get to see this happen. Now we just move up to the sight glass. Turn on our vacuum. And if everything is sealed, you'll notice You'll notice your mash running down from the top here. It just runs down inside and it's going to fill inside the still. A unique concept. Now at the conclusion of my transfer, you'll see that I've got, this is my sediment that I've left behind. Now I did, I'm going to sacrifice what? maybe five, six ounces, because I didn't want to suck up any of that sediment. But look what I've got here. I've got 
my five gallon carboy all full, almost all the way up to the neck, all I've got to do is remove this cap and then seal it and allow this to sit and settle. I've degassed it, but at the same time, I've transferred it without having to use any elevations at all. The process is simple. So, we've covered some very simple basics about transferring a mash from one container to another. Uh, we've even advanced that idea and theory uh, into uh, moving things into the still, which could be helpful for some of you. And others, it may not be helpful at all. You may be used to just pour it. That's quite all right. Remember, if it, it will work if you work the process with your methods, as long as you understand the key points in the process that you can't violate. Those key points are important, uh, but you can work your way around with different methods uh, to accomplish the same thing. Now, I know many people out there will have a bunch of great different ideas. Um, you, you know of the um, teardrop-shaped fermenters that collect all of the yeast sediment in the bottom? Those are wonderful, yeah. And you can drain those from the side. It's sort of like the same process, just a different method by which to get there. It, it all works. Uh, we wish you the very best in your distilling practices and hobbies. Oh yes, and then make sure you join us again for the next installment because then, yes, we are going to actually run this and we are going to produce uh, our moonshine. Oh, key point for you? Yes, in my haste to clean up and get things situated, I found ooh, about four gallons of moonshine that I had stashed in <laughs> different places. Uh, I don't have a distilling problem. I've got the lack of consumption. Happy distilling. Made a way back in top of them hills where they plenty of moonshine still.